we're going to be hearing more about today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, move on to our special guests. Um, again, please, a rem reminder, you can put questions in the chat. Um, so our two esteemed guests are going to touch on kind of both this macro level of the program and also the micro level of how one city is able to leverage it to create uh, some interim solutions really quickly. After their brief presentations, Q&A. Um, so without further ado, our two guests, uh, we have Sasha Hauswald, who is the Assistant Deputy Director in the Division of State Financial Assistance in the California Department of Housing and Community Development, or HCD. And we also have Wayne Chen, who is the Assistant Community Development Director for the City of Mountain View. So we are going to start off with uh, Sasha, and then we're going to move on to Wayne, and then we'll move on to some Q&A. So uh, thank you to our, our guests for being here, and thanks to everyone uh, for your participation. I'll let Sasha take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Actually, I can't see anybody, so somebody should verbally say yes. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Hey, so I'm Sasha. I am fairly new to HCD. This is my third month. Um, it's been a wild ride. It's a very, very exciting time at HCD. I am um, the Assistant Deputy Director for State Financial Assistance Programs, which means I oversee program design, selection, and award for a number of different programs for affordable housing development and preservation, including programs targeted for individuals experiencing homelessness and most notably HomeKey. Next slide, please. So with the pandemic placing people experiencing homelessness at a very high risk for COVID, HomeKey was created as a way to both support the travel industry and support owners of underutilized hotel and motel stock and also get people off the street into places where they could safely socially distance, stay clean, right? Wash hands frequently, stay healthy and not, um, not spread the virus. Next, next slide, please. The program was really only possible because of the coronavirus relief funds made available by the federal government and by supplemental funds from the state and philanthropy. Philanthropy was really critical to our success the first time around, um, providing operating subsidies for many of the home key projects. And as uh, many of you know well, those operating subsidies are really critical for providing decent housing with on-site staff um, and supports in buildings that are serving uh, homeless folks that have can provide essentially no rental income to support operations. So. The CRR funds were an incredible blessing, but also came with a super fast turnaround time to occupancy. The first round of home key was characterized by this intensity and urgency that was appropriate. It matched the need to get people off the street and into healthy conditions, but was also um, incredibly challenging for municipal staff and developer partners and HCD. Um, we had to meet a three month timeline from award to substantial occupancy. Um, the funds were, because of this incredibly fast turnaround time, most frequently used to purchase existing buildings. Um, they ranged from hotels and motels to vacant apartment buildings and even some new construction um, and convert those buildings as existing structures into homeless housing. Next slide. Some of the things that folks applauded, in other words, the things that my, my colleagues got right in the design of HomeKey 1.0 were geographic equity. Um, the department divided the state into eight regions, largely aligned with the councils of government to ensure that all parts of the state would have a fair shot at the funds. We also provided technical assistance and our philanthropic, philanthropic partners also uh, supported applicants, particularly communities in rural and lower resourced areas. So uh, the program provided a lot more assistance to applicants than we really ever have before, particularly through a pre-application consultation process, since this was both very new in concept, very new in design, and very fast turnaround. Um, in order to make it possible to meet those tight federal deadlines, we um, also were able to provide 
uh, discretionary approvals or conditional use permits. Sorry, home key projects were not subject to any discretionary discretionary approvals or conditional use permits by planning departments with jurisdiction over the project. So basically we were able to support projects to speed through to occupancy. Um, the home key statute also created a pathway for CEQA exemption. Most projects did not take that pathway. Certain conditions needed to be met um, and many uh, projects and municipalities had alternate ways to move through the planning approvals process. We also had strong cost controls and we wound up investing a total of about 129,000 per unit in state funds for the total acquisition and rehab costs. And now that doesn't count the matching funds that came from the municipalities or philanthropy, um, but it still is an impressively known low number if you're in the development business. Next slide. So eligible uses for home key. It could be used for acquisition and rehab of hotels, motels, or hostels, which is the most popular and most famous use. It could also be used for master leasing of properties. And it could be used for acquisition of other sites like apartments, homes, manufactured or modular housing, office conversion, or really any other buildings with existing residential uses that could be converted to permanent or inter interim housing. Um, Home Key 1.0 was uh, dominated by hotel and motel convert acquisitions. We don't necessarily anticipate seeing the same breakdown next time around, but 74 out of 94 projects in the first time were hotels or motels, but we did have uh, seven projects that were manufactured housing, six projects that were multifamily residential, four projects that were office or commercial conversion, and two projects that were scattered site single family projects. Next slide. In round one, there were also three different project types in terms of the home key use. Permanent housing, interim housing, and interim to permanent. Um, both the permanent and interim type projects needed to have a plan to cover their operations and services for five years um, and a plan to get to five, five, 55 year sustainability within 10 years. In the interim to permanent conversion projects, they need to have a clear conversion plan and timeline to move between interim housing and permanent supportive housing. Here's a nice little, oh, sorry, next slide, please. A really nice little um, infographic for the high level about Home Key 1.0. We had 51 public entities participate. Both municipalities and housing authorities were participants. We had 94 projects. We created about 6,000 units and housed about 8,000 individuals. Um, with a lot of diversity within that population of folks housed. Next slide. Part of the reason uh, for the success of 1.0, as I mentioned briefly before, was support from philanthropy um, that really supported operating and services. You can see here that the state was able to support beyond the federal CRF funds in some cases, but philanthropic dollars really did allow us to meet needs that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to with the federal funds alone or with state funds alone. Next slide. And I mentioned cost efficiency, right? The average per door acquired was $129,000, whereas new construction in California is, you know, upwards of 400 or even $500,000 per door. Um, we also did recognize that acquisitions have a higher per door appraised value in certain high cost areas. And so we did allow for higher per door values um, in some places and also in some cases that needed less upfront work. Uh, yep. And so my last slide is a little bit of a teaser about Home Key 2.0, and I expect we'll probably get a lot of questions about Home Key 2.0, some of which I will be able to answer and some of which I cannot answer because we are still in the budget negotiation process. 
but $3.5 billion has been pro proposed uh, by the governor under the California Comeback Plan. Uh, including $1 billion in funds specifically targeted toward homeless families for Home Key 2.0. And um, we're still kind of TBD on how much of that does wind up coming through in the budget negotiations and how much of that money is funded through ARPA, the American Recovery Act funding versus general fund that has a little bit more flexibility. If this funding comes through, we're going to be aiming for about 17,000 new interim and permanent housing units in the next three years. And so we are in the process of gearing up uh, with a lot of anticipation and a lot of onboarding and a lot of planning for our hoped for May Revise money. And with that, um, you can stop displaying my slides. I don't think we're gonna move to questions at this moment, or are we? My next slide is a question slide. Uh, thanks, Sasha. We're going to hold questions until after Wayne is gone, but you can still type questions into the chat. So the, that question slide is still useful. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if, uh, please, please, everyone, a reminder that you can add your questions at any time. Thanks so much, Sasha, um, for that. And I know now we're going to move on to Wayne. Great. Um, thanks so much, David. Um, want to thank um, SV at Home for um, inviting us here to um, share some thoughts about HomeKey. Um, my name is Wayne Chen. I'm the Assistant Community Development Director for the City of Mountain View. And then also want to thank everyone uh, who uh, have joined this um, presentation. appreciate your time and, and your interest. And um, why don't we um, go to the next slide? I'll just cover very quickly sort of an on the ground um, project um, that is live and that we've uh, worked um, actively on in Mountain View over the last um, several months. But um, what our project is falls into Sasha's category of uh, interim to permanent housing. And it's uh, one of the uh, manufactured slash modular housing projects. Um, and the city has a continuum of housing uh, needs that we're trying to solve for. And we have several hundred um, permanent housing uh, projects um, uh, in the pipeline. And what we're trying to do is sort of round that out and create some interim housing solutions as well for folks who need um, immediate attention. Uh, next slide. I'm trying to show some images here in the presentation, but just to share um, it was a very expedited um, delivery and project um, uh, approval timeline, um, as Sasha mentioned. From the application period to about um, May, it took about 10 months, but the actual demolition, um, uh, uh, beginning of the site work um, to project completion, getting folks moved in was six months from about November to, to May. Uh, the city partnered with Life Moves, who is the service provider um, for this project. And then they also partnered with Ceres Regis, who led the site development and the um, placement of the modular units on the site. Uh, next slide. Uh, the site's one acre. Uh, as you saw, it was a, a previous um, kind of an auto body um, uh, uh, site and um, it's been reused for this interim housing solution. There's 100 doors, uh, 124 beds, and the uh, target is to um, help serve folks who are seniors um, and families who um, were unsheltered and who had particular COVID-19 impacts. Um, the cost is about 160 a door um, with the land. Uh, and without the land, it's about 125 a door, sort of in line with what Sasha was saying in, the, in terms of the average cost and much lower than um, some of the, the new ground up construction. Um, we're hoping that uh, about three to 400 folks will be able to be served uh, per year because this is interim housing. The Life Moves' its goal is to get folks stabilized and then help transition folks to more permanent housing. And so the typical uh, duration for folks to be in one of these housing units is about three to four months. Um, but there is flexibility for a longer duration if it's needed. Um, and it's really meant to provide um, doors, uh, their own doors for their own household, uh, which is really great. 
Uh, next slide. There, because this is a, a modular, really a new new development, um, we really had an opportunity to have a really modern and thoughtfully designed um, project. Here is uh, an image of uh, one of the interior um, suites. Uh, next slide. Um, another uh, image uh, with a bunk bed, you know, to be able to help serve families. Um, sort of a nighttime image of, of um, the key corridor uh, down the project. Uh, next slide. And then there is also amenity space on site too. So there is a little um, children's play area with um, soft touch surfaces, um, things they can climb on. Um, this other image on the right is this uh, communal area where um, food and events can be um, hosted and, and, and food prepped, um, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. We just wanted to share very briefly, um, we are getting um, a lot of interest and inquiries from you know, other cities and staff. Um, and there's a lot of interest in um, the groundwork and the policy framework that allowed, uh, I think, the city to be able to partner on this project and to move um, quickly to yeah. realize, to realize it, a, a new type of housing project uh, in the city. So I would just say that um, we have a really strong council um, on, on housing. And so we have great elected leadership. Um, there's a, a significant alignment with this project to city priorities. And so we have um, our council who establishes major goals uh, and work plan items every couple of years. And um, uh, equitable communities creating housing for all has been um, on the major goals list. So that really syncs up well with this project. We have our... Um, consolidated plan and housing elements, uh, kind of the wonkier policy documents that are HUD required, uh, uh, federally required and state required documents to help um, address housing across the needs. And the city has endorsed the county's community plan to end homelessness. And we're working with folks closely on that um, to, help, um, to help implement that plan and, and have a, a, a local response to, to any homelessness. Uh, so we're contributing to local needs as well as contributing to contributing to responding to local needs as well as um, uh, uh, addressing this issue on a region wide scale. And then finally, because we have this um, leadership and a set of priorities, we were able to really internally mobilize all of our teams to <laughs> run as fast as we can. Um, there's a link here and I'm happy to share it after this, um, uh, but it's a, it's a website that has some more information, um, groundbreaking video, um, showing the opening ceremony um, and other information as well. Next slide. This is just a quick uh, visual imagery of uh, all the things that had to happen in six months. Again, it was working with uh, an internal team with Life Moves with Saris Regis on a brand new um, project and on a uh, type of project we have not done before, which was modular housing. We've learned a lot through, through that. As Sasha mentioned, he, um, it was not necessarily uh, an easy process, but it was an important process and it's um, an important project. And so we had to move on the fly and modify some of our, our the way that we would typically um, uh, approve a project. And so, you know, going through this process, we have some great um, learnings from it. We'll be able to apply it to future projects. And um, that's an exciting part for us too. Uh, next slide. It took um, a lot of folks working together, um, whether as a development partner, um, as a joint applicant to the Home Key program and as funding partners. And we had great um, public private partnership with philanthropy, um, uh, our, our business community who help provide funding uh, for this project. Uh, next slide. I just wanted to share a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the types of manufactured um, units that we're using that Life Moves and Service we just helped secure. And there are actually four different types of manufacturer um, products that are on the site. And um, Urban Block, Connect Homes, Indie Dwell, and Falcon Structures are the four. Uh, there are four here because of the timing of the, the project and wanted to make sure that there was enough a manufacturing capacity to develop all the units um, quickly enough given the compressed time frame. But also some structures may be particularly suited for folks um, 
for their units. And then there are several units using modular um, uh, units for uh, case management. So this has an active component of case management and service provision on site with a 24 seven um, on site person from Life Moves. But there are several individual private rooms to help uh, meet with, uh, with folks and, and uh, deliver the services that they need on an individual tailored basis. So um, with that, um, just wanted to conclude uh, my portion of the presentation and look forward to the uh, Q&A discussion. Great, thank you so much, Wayne. Uh, so uh, we're gonna move on to Q and A. Um, you know, if we were in person, we would all be raising our hands, and we hope to be doing that again soon in the future. But for now, it's it's going to be easiest, I think, if everyone uh, puts any questions they have into the chat, and uh, we will uh, try to get to as many of them as we can. So um, there was one question. The first question that came in um, from John um, about the the new draft regulations and. I, I know that um, uh, Sasha referred to this a little bit. So I don't know, Sasha, if you have any information that you can share with us about um, if the budget is continuing to go through on time, if there's any timelines or things that you're aware of in terms of when, um, how, how the process would probably work as home key 2.0. And if you can just kind of guess, then that's all you can do. We understand that too. Sure, so um, I'm not sure I'm saying uh, I'm not so good at monitoring the chat, so I can answer your question, but I'm not sure it's going to be exactly the same as what the original question was. In uh, We're anticipating if the budget goes through in a timely manner that we will be issuing a NOFA by September. Um, so that is our goal, is that we would be able to begin the application process in the early fall. Gotcha. And... Um... Do you, do you have any, is there anything that you can share about um, things that you expect might be slightly different this go around or things that have been considered in terms of uh, changes to the program or improvements to the program that you're anticipating um, will be part of that process? I can share a couple of things and if people have more specific questions, I'm happy to share, share more about any kind of particular items of interest because there, there are a lot of, um, a lot of things that worked and then a lot of feedback that we got about the first round. So one thing that comes up a lot is, will our per door subsidy be the same? Um, and I think we can share that we still wanna keep, uh, keep an emphasis on cost containment. That was definitely one of the reasons that HomeKey was so applauded the first time around. Uh, but we also acknowledge that the world is a different place than it was when HomeKey 1.0 launched, right? There's not gonna be as many, uh, hotel and motels sitting vacant and for sale at low prices. So our per door subsidy may need to go up a little bit. Um, similarly, right, speed to occupancy and the urgency was really important. It mobilized people. Um, but we also faced a lot of un unanticipated challenges and some projects weren't able to meet their deadline for uh, substantial occupancy. And so we're expecting that we might uh, lengthen that timeline a bit, right? So moving something like from three months to six months for substantial occupancy. Great, thanks, Sasha. There's one. Um, there's another question that um, you know you might have some comments on, and maybe Wayne might have some some thoughts on. We had a question from uh, Yana that was about um, really questions about um, families with children. Um, and kind of the, the needs for those households and how those are addressed through these programs. And so um, I'm curious about um, if you guys have any comments on um, really the approach to, to providing, um, you know, different housing options that can be accommodating of children, that can be accommodating of seniors, um, and how either HDD's approach that or, you know, in the case of Mountain View, if there are certain things that are part of this project that, that you did to try to make sure that, that we could meet the needs of, you know, a full range of, of people in need. Um, so is the question about how can HomeKey 
um, accommodate like a wider variety of stock besides just hotels and motels, like more multifamily kind of units with more bedrooms, or is it about the, the kinds of services or locations that families might need? Um, it, it seems kind of like a combination. The question I think is kind of a combination of, of, of both of those, those issues, um, specifically about the type of, uh, properties that are proving better or are, are more accommodating to, to, you know, fans with children or seniors um, and how those needs are being assessed and, and trying to be met. Um, well, I guess what I'd say is from our side, we do have, um, there's a, a strong and appropriate policy push to focus on uh, housing for families. And what that means is that we hope that municipalities will come to us with more multifamily projects, more projects that have two or more bedrooms that can accommodate families. And that obviously means also that our per door amount is gonna have to be higher for those bigger units. Um, in HomeKey 1.0 and in HomeKey 2.0, we have required planning for services. And so while we are not the experts on what kinds of services and supports families need, we are asking municipalities to, to do a thoughtful planning process, regardless of the target population, to make sure that they have that in place. And maybe Wayne can, can talk a little bit more about the local, local efforts. Sure, thanks, Sasha. Uh, just a comment about um, the Mountain View Home Key project specifically, and then um, a larger thought. So um, there are, uh, 12 family units in uh, Mountain View Home Key. Um, you saw the, the image with the bunk beds. And so that was a specific intentional incorporation to be able to help address some of the needs that families may have um, who, are, who are unsheltered. And um, from, a, from a services perspective for Home Key, um, I, I mentioned the um, play area and the case management area, but um, the services are again tailored to the needs of each household. Um, there, there's a computer space, and um, uh, I think one of the module units has an area that's like a reading area and a homework space. So, trying to build in the services and amenities and programming at the front end is really important. Um, from a larger perspective, the the city of Mountain View is looking at creating um, strategies to respond. Uh, to a broad range of needs. I'm not just looking to create it, we, we're doing it now. So um, I mentioned we have several hundred uh, permanent housing units in the pipeline. We look at it from a, a complementary holistic systems approach. We try to. Um, and we have uh, a few projects where um, there's an intentional incorporation of larger um, uh, units for families. So we have a downtown project right now right across the street from City Hall. Um, it's called our Lot 12 Project. And it's um, converting a public parking um, site into 120 units of affordable with half the units um, at least for, for families. So, um, and there's a ground floor component as well in terms of creating uh, amenity space um, that could be accessible to both the residents um, in the project and in the community, but also interior um, courtyard space um, and amenities that can help serve families too. So um, just a comment there on, on the project specific aspect and the sort of a larger general approach that we're trying to take to address um, a wide spectrum of needs, including families. Okay, thank you guys. Um, you know, going back to Wayne, I think there was a question about really kind of because of these tight timelines, if there was, um, you know, a specific strategy that the city used in terms of its uh, teams that normally work on these types of developments to actually be able to move this forward faster and to get it done on time. Sure, yeah, Th thanks a lot for that question. I think, we, you know, we learned a lot on the fly um, and so reflecting on our particular experience, I think um, the first thing that was really important was um, all the departments had an understanding that this was an important uh, priority project. And so that helped. Um, we, we had great um, collaboration across the departments and um, it, on the city side, uh, we had key staff in the city manager's office who was co-leading the process with, with, with me down in community development. Um, we didn't, you know, create 
sort of new new formats or teams necessarily, and that might be something for us to consider uh, for another project uh, going forward. Um, ideally, the timelines are a little bit uh, um, longer for us to be able to, to move forward, but I think we adapted existing processes um, and, and convened folks as needed. So we did a bit of um, ad hoc, not a bit, we did a, a bit of, quite a bit of ad hoc um, meetings. We, um, for example, review the building permit package in a different way. You know, typically we would wanna have um, everything bundled together really nice and clean and moving forward, but that does take some time. So we tried to take a look to see how we can um, unpack that package and, and move things uh, more in parallel. Um, so those are some kind of process uh, modifications. Um, and then we sort of worked within our existing kind of department structures, but I think it, it began with folks understanding that it needed to get prioritized. And so the room was made in our, in our, we tried to make room in our workspace, even while other things were, were going on with other projects. So, um, I think more, it was trying to find a new way to do the process of approving the project. Um, and sort of loosely figuring out ways to meet um, rapidly on an ad hoc basis, but we had a like a, a, a co-led process in the city. Um, hopefully they gave a little bit of insight. Yeah, thanks Wayne. Uh, there are two quick follow-ups and I think some things that were mentioned other questions. And uh, one thing, Wayne, real quick, someone was asking about the Lot 12 project. If, if there's just a brief description you could share about what that project is hoping to um do in terms of affordability and then sasha i know there was a there was a follow-up about the september nofa and if there's any more estimation you can provide about um when the awards might be targeted or what the timeline would be about closing um, um, on that even if it's just based on the past experience of the program sure yeah i can talk to touch um uh, really briefly on lot 12 but it, it is a uh, one and a half acre site um, located right in the heart of downtown. Um, again, just uh, north of the um, Civic Center. So north of the, the library and city hall. Um, it went through a city RFQ, RFP process that um, concluded last uh, May. And, and that's when the council selected the um, developer team. And the, you know, the range of uh, income uh, income levels is, you know, from from thirty percent AMI area median income to sixty percent AMI with, um, again, a key component with um, uh, family size units. Uh, we are working with the developer to explore um, incorporating rapid rehousing uh, units um, on the site as well. So that's in the process of being determined and figuring out how to, you know, put the financing together uh, for this project. And there is an element of uh, mixed use ground space to create a, a community amenity, not just for the residents on site, but for, um, for the broader community. So um, there, there will be a, about a one third, one third split between extremely low income units. That's what we're targeting right now. Another one third for very low income, and then another um, uh, one third for low income units up, up to 60% um, AMI. Um, and in terms of the question about timing, um, I wish that I could give really hard dates, right? That's definitely what everybody wants to be able to plan around. Uh, I guess my, one question that I would like to know is, um, is, is sooner better? for folks who are already talking to owners and already looking at sites, like would it be better if we were able to have requirements to close by the end of 2021 or would that actually be harmful to some folks who need a longer timeline? Um, well, that's great, thanks, Sasha. I think if um, that'd be great if, if people have thoughts on that, I think we can make sure that they are I can get your email address or they can put it in the chat and we can make sure that they can provide some feedback if that will be helpful. Um, 
So um, one thing that we got a question, this might be a, a tough question, but I think maybe that's why it's a good question is a question about um, um, a city, I, I don't know which city this came in from, um, is trying attempting to convert a room key project to a home key project, um, but they're not clear on the pathway. Is there, um, is that something that Sasha, that, that you can speak to? Um, if it's, maybe it's something that if it's, uh, complicated question. Maybe it's an opportunity for follow up after this discussion. Yeah, I think that's a good opportunity for follow up. Thank you. Okay. Um, one question that's come up, I think, a couple of times is is a question about um, what are we going to do when emergency program funding runs out? People are wondering about what's the longevity of these current programs and how they're operating. I'm wondering if, if either of you could speak to that in terms of, I mean, there was some mention of you know, philanthropic dollars being important in this first round. Um, I'm curious about uh, what comments you have about uh, moving forward. There's, there's this funding now, there's this need now, but you know, we know that the need is going to, is going to continue and um, what is the, is there thinking around um, how uh, these projects can continue to be funded going forward? Um, that would be, that would be of interest. Um, so the question, it sounds like the question is about specifically the home key projects that are already funded or would be funded in, in round 2.0. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so um, for better or for worse, more for worse, um, the state cannot provide the kind of long-term operating subsidy that would be ideal, right? It would be great if we had a lot more project-based housing vouchers or something equivalent that could support operations over the course of that 55-year affordability period, but we just don't have the resources for that. And so instead, we are looking to maximize um, operating subsidy for a couple of years and really it falls on our partners, um, folks like Wayne to figure out what's gonna happen next. And so just like in 1.0 municipalities had to have a plan for sustaining the project over the, the long term. that's also what we're gonna be requiring in 2.0. So I don't know if Wayne, you might be able to speak to that transition plan um, and, and what you're thinking about for future projects. Sure, definitely. Yeah, I appreciate that and agree about the, the funding. And I, I would um, add on to say there really are sort of the, the two key buckets for, for funding. One is the capital just to get the project up and then the long-term sustainability of the project to be able to operate it. So we need a lot more for both. Um, and, and certainly a lot more for um, you know, responding to folks who are currently unsheltered. Um, I think, you know, for the Mountain View Home Key um, project, Life Moves is a very experienced operator of these interim housing um, um, projects. I believe they've, I, I should remember this number, but I think in the thousands of units that they operate. Um, so they have a lot of experience um, working with folks to um, provide the services on site and then to help transition folks to, to permanent housing. Um, they have a particular operating model and I think this could be an interesting you know conversation you know maybe in another hack in terms of how are nonprofits um, operating um, these sorts of projects but um, certainly they, they work closely with their um, their board and their their, their staff with um, you know a, a funding program, a fundraising program. There is going to be continued, I think, um, outreach with the partners that they've worked with um, and new partners to um, continue to fill in the operating um, over the next um, few years. We are looking at whether, um, in addition to this Home Key 2.0, there is another funding source. It's a CDBG, it's a Community Development Block Grant funded Home Key project uh, program, it's separate from Home Key 2.0, but there um, is some opportunity for funding to existing Home Key projects. So I know, I know we're taking a look at that. So that's pretty um, you know, micro on this particular project, but it has sort of the same elements for future projects, which is the city has, funding for permanent housing. Um, 
uh, I think more funding is needed for interim housing and whether it's interim or permanent housing, a lot more funding from somewhere um, for the operating is, is gonna be needed. Um, I think cities are typically, should they have any programs at all for uh, um, um, doing housing? It's typically on the capital funding side, not the operating side. So we partner really closely with the county as well for operating resources. So I think, you know, there's a lot of parts here, but um, I think in the future, the ability to generate, you know, more funds from, you know, a regional or state level and maybe opportunities for new funding sources with new partners, it should be all on the table, I think. And I'll just add that I think in the, in the future, um, sort of 2.0, putting your project together for sustainability partnerships with housing authorities is going to be also really promising. We had housing authorities apply um, in the first time around and were some of our uh, really successful projects. Um, and I think housing authorities have some unique access to funds and maybe that's going to be increasingly so as the administration funnels more money to um, public housing and project-based Section 8. So, great, and I think Wayne, you're starting, to, you're touching on an important piece that I think has come been kind of a thread through your presentation, which is that for the city of Mountain View, this is one piece of broader response to homelessness and helping house people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so I don't know if you, there's um, if there are any other. Uh, we're starting to run out of time here. We're going to have to close up soon, but. Um, I, I'd love if, if there's, you know, you, you could maybe share a little bit about how this fits within kind of the city's broader approach, because I think it's really important that, you know, this is one really key tool that a city like Mountain View has been able to use, but it's, it's still part of kind of a broader, a broader approach that's goal is to provide permanent, permanent housing solutions for, for people. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. And maybe I'll respond with um, stay in a little bit higher level and talk about the various things that the city is, is, um, is going to be working on, is currently working on. And so uh, we'll be rolling out a um, strategic plan that will be guiding the work over the next few years. Um, this is building off of the major goals process that I mentioned earlier uh, in, in my presentation, but um, there's a community, uh, communities um, for all um, aspect in our strategic plan to have a you know inclusive community and seeking to build um, housing intentionally uh, with intentional strategy to, to serve a, a variety of needs. Um, there is a race equity and inclusion initiative um, that the city is working on and looking at ways of how this um, initiative could fold into um, the various things that the city is working on, including housing. Uh, a key priority is responding to displacement. And so we've been working on trying to put together the pieces for a displacement response strategy. Um, in partnership with Destination Home, we'll be uh, working to develop a, a homelessness response strategy to help meet and address local needs, build off the um, efforts we've um, already undertaken, um, but to kind of build on that even more, um, to have a strategy in place to address local and regional needs. Um, and then we're looking at, again, trying to help fund and move forward um, all the projects in our pipeline, um, including a potential uh, partnership, uh, partnership with the county to um, actually do one of those more typical home key projects, um, a hotel acquisition for permanent housing. So. We're trying to pull all these pieces together. Uh, these are large efforts. Um, it requires a lot of work, um, requires you know, input to make sure we have a really good um, intentional and, and strategic plan. And eventually all these things converge in some way or another. So we wanna kind of pull them together so that they're talking to each other. Um, it's holistically done. And I would say Project Home Key you know, fall, falls within that. So I think our work, you know, over the next year and few years is to help pull all those strands together um, in, into an even more co coordinated um, and strategic response. And again, I think it's, you know, the groundwork that's laid by 
by uh, our, our council and by the strategic plans that we've laid out at the high level. And it helps us to create these buckets of work that we can then pull together in a coordinated way. Great, thanks, Wayne. Um, so we're we're starting to run out of time here, and we're going to want to close close momentarily. Um, I think Wayne kind of wrapped up real well about kind of the city's approach. I wanted to see if Sasha had any uh, final parting thoughts she wanted to to share with us, um, but. Um, I'm not going to completely put her, put her on the spot, but um, I think that that we we would love to you know we can help um, uh, provide connections to Sasha and Wayne in terms of other follow up questions or more detailed questions that that people have about um, Home Key 2.0 or about what the City of Mountain View is doing. Um, I think, and I will have to look to them to see if. If they nod or not, if, if we if we can share um, some of the materials that they presented today, or at least some version of them, but that's something we can we will also I know people ask about that, and that's something that we can we can also follow up on. Um, but I wanted to see if, if Sasha <laughs> putting you on the spot and any last things that that you'd like to like to share before we we wrap up. Uh, no, that's fine. So. Um, I am excited that people are excited about HomeKey 2.0, and I know that the uncertainty um, is really, it's really difficult. It's difficult on our side, it's difficult for folks who are trying to line up deals. Um, so I both beg your patience and encourage your enthusiasm and urgency, right? And I know that's a difficult balance to strike. We are going to work you know, around the clock, just like we did the last time to get our NOFA out as soon as possible to get you clarity on timelines and specifics with what is gonna be required. Um, and I think my encouragement is to say, you know, unless budget negotiations really go in a, in a very different direction, um, we are going to have a lot of resources, and so I definitely do encourage folks to start identifying those sites and um, figuring out how you're going to be able to close deals with something approximating the last round of um, support that you received from HomeKey 1.0, right? We're not going to be wildly divergent. It's not going to be like $500,000 per door. So you do have some uh, something to plan around if you think about 1.0 as a model that we're not going to be extremely divergent from, but I definitely also encourage you to think creatively like, um, like y'all did the first time around with the, with the modular housing. So. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sasha. Um, and so, you know, we're going to, we're going to wrap things up here. Big thanks to Sasha and Wayne. Again, we're going to um, find a way to make sure we can get information out to people if there are other more details they want to follow up on and, and get you some information from their presentations. You know, the whole purpose of the hack is not just, is not just, doesn't just end education, but also that kind of trying to provide opportunities for people to engage and get involved in things that they're learning about. And so a little bit earlier in the program, my colleague, uh, Bob Stromberg from Destination Home put some information in a chat about housing ready communities. Maybe I can get uh, Bob to do that again. Allison is also putting in the link through our website. Um, but that if you're looking for opportunities to get more involved around uh, learning about how you can advocate for housing for, for people who are experiencing homelessness in our community and actually take action. Um, uh, the uh, Destination Homes Housing Ready Communities Initiative is the perfect place uh, for you to go. So there, there it is. Uh, there are, and as Bob notes, there are some upcoming workshops uh, where you will actually can learn more about how you can yourself take action in your community to help uh, create permanent housing solutions for our community members who are experiencing homelessness. So um, I'm going to say thank you once again to our panelists. I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague Gabby, who's just going to provide a few closing remarks. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Awesome. 
Thank you, David. So Gabby Travis Lopez, um, I am the communications and membership manager for SB at Home. And um, we'd be remiss to not invite you to become a member and help support this work that we're doing together. Um, obviously, you'll be on our email list and take part in our action alerts. But really, it's it's to collectively um, support the policy work that we do every day. So um, I will share in the chat a link. If you're not a member, we invite you to become one. Um, and if you are, you could always recruit other members um, and folks that want to get involved um, and be be strategically tied to all of the work that we do. So um, I also wanted to call out um, beyond the membership that we have a few members from IC COHO here, which is our coalition of housers, which is um, professionals in the housing space that are looking to connect and network and learn and, and grow their technical skills um, and soft skills. And so um, COHO is also another program that we run for, um, you know, we, we say young professionals, but it's really anyone that's getting, um, doing work in, in housing. And so um, we invite you to be, be, um, join their network. Um, so thank you so much. And we look forward to connecting again. I know on the hills of a affordable housing month, we were busy. Uh, and so we appreciate you, your continued um, engagement. So have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, become a member.